Thank you, Sam, for a very, a very kind words. Uh, I wish uh, my uh, wife would be in here. She would have heard it for the first time, some good things. <laughs> I wish my late mother would be, to be here. Um, I, in uh, the, the two talks today and tomorrow, I hope to cover uh, a, a topic which actually I try and cover in a whole course or module in the university in a term. So I try and squeeze into uh, two, uh, basically not too long lectures, uh, a topic which uh, deserves a much more expanded series of uh, lectures. Uh, I think we can compensate for the uh, lack of time to discuss everything by knowing that many of you probably have the background and know um, much of what I'm going to talk about anyway. Uh, and for those who are relatively new to the topic, uh, at least I hope this will be uh, an appetizer uh, to read more and to engage in the conversation on Palestine here in the United States, which is a very important one not just for the sake of Palestinians and Israelis, but I think also for the sake of America's global uh, standing uh, and future relationship uh, with the Middle East and the Muslim world. The Zionist movement emerged in the late 19th century uh, out of two impulses. And I would say that these were in many ways noble impulses. The first impulse was to find a safe haven for communities in Central and Eastern Europe that felt in the late 19th century more than ever before as being under threat of uh, annihilation. And uh, uh, communities who had suffered years of persecution and discrimination and there was a sense among community leaders and activists in the Jewish community in the late 19th century that worse is to come. And of course, they were vindicated uh, in the next century uh, when European Jewry suffered uh, a genocide uh, during uh, the Holocaust. So the first, I think, impulse, the most basic reason for creating the Zionist movement was to find a safe place for endangered Jewish communities. The second impulse was to redefine Judaism as a national movement. Uh, this was not unique to the Jewish communities in Europe. Ever since the Spring of Nations in 1848, quite a few religious, cultural, and ethnic communities in Europe uh, felt that they would be better defined and would better cater for their own needs if they would adopt this new idea of nationalism. So Judaism, in the eyes of Zionist activists, were not just, was not just a religion, but also a national movement. The uh, idea was, from very early on, that if you want to save the Jewish communities in Europe and you want to redefine Judaism as a national movement, you cannot do it on European soil. You have to look for a different continent, a different place. Now, this is the age of colonialism we are talking about. Oh, I didn't turn off. Do you need my mic? Yes. <laughs> yes. You do? OK. Is that better? I don't, I don't hear any difference. <laughs> uh, there's a green light on my trousers. But maybe that indicates something else. I don't know. Uh, can you hear me now? Did I do something wrong? Could you move the microphone up just a little, maybe? Can you take it up? Yeah. Okay. I think we're hearing something different now. Oops. Oh. Sorry about that. Is it better? Yes. You have to say this. Because there's no other option. <laughs> I'll warm up anyway. Um, 
So uh, the, the idea was that geographically you cannot satisfy these two impulses in Europe. And this being the age of colonialism uh, and, be, and the movement being a European movement, it's not surprising that the rest of the world seemed open. Uh, as some of you may know, that uh, the first choice was actually uh, a place in the United States, not far away from the Niagara Falls. <laughs> uh, which the leaders of the Zionist movement thought would be the new found Jerusalem, so to speak. Uh, then there were talks about Azerbaijan, Argentina. The most famous option was Uganda uh, in Africa, and of course Palestine. Palestine as well, due to the centrality of Palestine in Judaism. Uh, uh, but it was not, in many ways, the, the first choice and the leader of the Zionist movement, Theodor Herzl, uh, preferred Uganda actually to Palestine. The reason that eventually Palestine was chosen had to do with uh, uh, Christian Zionism, uh, or Zionist Christians, Christian Zionism, as it was called then, uh, uh, which appeared in the very early 19th century on both sides of the Atlantic. Evangelical churches regarded the idea of the return of the Jews to Palestine as, of course, a precursor of the divine scheme for the resurrection and the second coming of the Messiah. Uh, uh, and the uh, return of the Jews was an important element in it. And, and definitely there was a pressure on the Zionist movement to choose Palestine for Christian reasons. Uh, needless to say that sometimes happened with some churches uh, the motive was also anti-Semitic. If you can both precipitate the second coming of the Messiah and get rid of the Jews in Europe in the same ticket, <laughs> that's quite a good idea. <laughs> and of course, you don't tell the Jews on the trip, uh, don't read the small letters. Small letters said that when the Messiah is coming back, you guys have to convert to Christianity or you will be shish kebab in hell. <laughs> uh, and uh, that, that part of the scheme is still there with Christian Zionists, as you know today. Uh, but they are the best allies of Israel, uh, because either Israelis like to be barbecued in hell, or they don't read the small letters. I would go for the second uh, option when it comes to Israelis. Um, in any case, whatever the historical reasons are, Palestine was chosen as the venue in which one could satisfy these two noble impulses, safety and national independence, if you want. As you all probably know, the problem is that Palestine was not empty. And uh, from very early on, and, and this is very well documented for, for one particular reason, uh, early Zionist settlers were quite obsessive diarists and writers. Every thought they had, every mosquito bite they suffered from, you, you can read about, it, probably more than you would like to. And there's nothing there that escaped their pen. And, uh, and there are mountains of documents one can, one can read if you want to reconstruct both the leader's perception of what to do with the indigenous native population of Palestine and the more sort of average member of the movement. And do remember, we, when we're talking about the early Zionist movement, let's say from 1880 to 1930s, it's a very small number. It's uh, 150,000, maybe 200,000, uh, and, and therefore it's quite a manageable community for a researcher to have a good idea of what people felt. What they felt uh, is still with us today. And uh, the basic idea was that people believed or wanted to believe that A, once they chose Palestine, they chose an ancient homeland. So the basic concept was of returning to a homeland. Now what do you do when you return to a homeland and someone else is in your home? <laughs> Uh, the fact that you actually left home 2,000 years ago is forgotten in this kind of engagement. And what matters is that someone has illegally occupied your home. And that comes very strongly in the early Zionist writing and also in the a way that Zionist leaders and Zionist discourse develops in the 1920s and the 1930s. The 
So there is kind of a paradox, typical to colonialist movements, by the way, that Palestinians sometimes are not there because it's very uh, convenient to treat Palestine as terra nuda, an empty land, as did the settlers who came to Australia, treated the aboriginals presence there. But sometimes they are there, and then you have to demonize them uh, in order to disregard their connection to the place. So they are either absent or they are usurpers or the illegal occupants of your homeland. Uh, the, the Zionist movement in the 1920s and the 1930s, to be fair, was not very occupied with the question of what would be the fate of the Palestinians in, uh, in Palestine. They were busy with other wars. Would the international community protect them? Would there be enough Jews? This is before the Holocaust. Would, be, there, would be there enough Jews who would come to, to, to Palestine? Can they create uh, an independent state under the British mandate and so on? In a very uh, uh, bizarre and a very, uh, of course, painful way, one could say that the Holocaust and even the, the rise in Nazism and fascism before the Holocaust in the 1930s, calmed down some of the Zionist fears. Uh, Jews were coming to Europe, uh, from Europe, because it was impossible to stay in Europe as a Jew. Uh, the community in Palestine reached quite a sizable number. And it seemed that the British mandatory authorities allowed the Zionist community to build a state within a state, or build an infrastructure for future state. And this is when. In 1936, 1937, Zionist leaders begin to pay to attract attention or uh, uh, divert their attention to the question of what would be the fate of the Palestinians in Palestine. And something very clear comes out from there up to the end of the British mandate. For the Jewish community in Palestine to not only to survive, but also to thrive, to excel, to succeed, and for the Jewish community to become democratic, to be part of a democratic world, for that to happen, it has to have an absolute majority in the land. It also has to have a control over much of the land. So there is a geographical dimension, and there is a demographic dimension. It comes very clear out in the late 1930s. Jews have to be to have supremacy, if possible, exclusivity, <coughs> and Jews have to have physical control over the ancient land of Palestine. The problem is, of course, that even in 1938, the Jews are still only one third of the population, and they don't have control even over one square inch of Palestine. So they're waiting for the right historical moment. And that historical moment comes in 1948, when the British government decides that it had enough for fighting both Jews and Arabs, and in, in any case, the British Empire uh, collapses after the Second World War. The day the British mandatory authorities informed both Jews and Arabs that the British mandate is coming to an end is the day that the Zionist political and military leadership decided on the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. That's the moment when the, everything comes into place for the leadership of the Zionist movement. They can they have a chance to create a Jewish state. They have a chance to create a democratic Jewish state to be part of the Western world. And they have a chance to get rid of the Arabs, or the Palestinians, because uh, it's very near to the Holocaust. There is an inbuilt immunity for anything Jews would do two years or three years after the Holocaust. And in many ways, they exploited the decision of Arab neighboring states to go to war against the future Jewish state. So they would use the situation of the war to implement an ethnic cleansing program. I would say that the final details of that program uh, are articulated in March 1948, by now the famous or infamous land of the Jewish military forces, the Haganah, uh, in Palestine. Now, ethnic cleansing is a very loaded uh, term, and one should be careful. 
uh, one uses such terms. Uh, but uh, in my book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, <coughs> I decided to use a source which I don't always regard as the beacon of truth, but I knew that all my Israeli Jewish friends and their friends around the world treat it as a beacon of truth. And this is the website of the State Department. The website of the State Department has a very clear definition of ethnic cleansing. And I tried to show in my book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, how that definition fits uh, what happened in Palestine in 47 14. It's very interesting that according to the State Department, you don't even need to have a clear-cut master plan for expulsion. You don't need to expel the whole population. And you do not, do not need to make sure that not everyone is allowed to return to be regarded as an ethnic cleanser. So even in the soft version, what the Zionist movement did to the Palestinians was ethnic cleansing. I think it's even harsher than that. Um, all in all, as you probably know, the Israelis' army, within seven months, expelled half of Palestine's population. And if you want to understand the magnitude of the crime, you actually have to look at the map of Israel. Israel was built over 80% of Palestine. In the 80% of Palestine that became the Jewish state, 80% of the population were expelled. Half of Palestine villages were destroyed. When I say they were destroyed, they were wiped out. Uh, and instead of their place, uh, the, the new Jewish state created either Jewish settlements or planted uh, uh, recreational forests. The urban uh, space of Palestine changed beyond recognition. Whole cities just disappeared. Uh, 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 in Haifa, a Palestinian population, uh, out of Palestinian population of 70,000 people, uh, out of that population, only a few thousands were left. And there are similar proportions in Jaffa. Uh, and there are towns that were just demolished and disappeared altogether. Now, it's very interesting that the Israeli narrative was that this was done voluntarily. Palestinians must be very special people. I mean, so they obliterate the cities voluntarily. They leave their homes voluntarily. Uh, it's, it's like a big picnic. Let's go out <laughs> and put some TNT in our house. Leave it. Great fun. Never to come back to where we live for 700 years. I don't think there's any other historical crime that was committed that, that has such a counter narrative. There are counter narratives to criminal acts. People justify it. They find extenuating circumstances. The Israeli invention is that the Palestinians did it voluntarily. I've never heard such a thing about any other case study. Uh, and to, I must tell you, visiting the states again and again, uh, it's the, the last place it's being believed is here. Israelis don't believe it anymore. But <laughs> Americans do. Well, you are gullible people in many ways. Yeah. You know that. Uh, it's quite easy to sell you fables such as these without much effort. Uh, but um, it, it's really time to wake up. Uh, people do not voluntarily destroy their villages and cities and leave their home country. And people who are not allowed to come back, whatever the reason is, are being expelled. This is another of the sort of uh, uh, fabrication of history that since some of the Palestinians did leave because they were afraid they were not allowed to go back but the Israelis count them as people who voluntarily left if the city of medicine would be under the danger of being nuclear and the nuclear attack from Canada and you will all leave you would not voluntarily leave you leave because you think that nuclear bombs <laughs> are not a place, are not a situation you like to encounter. And if you would not be allowed to return after the threat is over, if the mayor of Madison would not, at least some of you would like <laughs> to see them back, he would expel you. And according to the international law, he would commit a crime. The amazing thing about 90, the 1948 ethnic cleansing is 
that on the ground you had reporters, including from the New York Times. On the ground you had emissaries of the International Red Cross. You had uh, people working for the United Nations. People saw with their own eyes. In fact, if you read American reports, people talk about expulsion all the time in their reports from the from the, uh, the ground itself. In 1948, there was no need for the new historians to wait for the big declassification of new archives to know that. But the editors in chief in New York, the head of the Red Cross, the Secretariat of the United Nations, decide for understandable reasons that two and a half years or three years after the Holocaust, you don't blame the Jews of committing crime. There are more even cynical interests behind hiding this crime. And the reason is Germany. Already in 48, 49, it was very important for the West to reintroduce Germany to the community of civilized nations. It was very important, I mean Western Germany, <laughs> because the Cold War was raging. Mm -hmm. and it was very important, Germany was a front line. And a deal was created the only people who could say that Germany is a new Germany were the Israelis. Because they were the representative in the eyes of the world of the Jewish victims of the Holocaust. They were the ones. And they were willing to absorb Germany, to, to allow it to come back to the community or family of nations. The price was that the world decided to be silent on what happened uh, in Palestine. There were other more objective reasons or more easy reasons to understand after the Second World War because so many people were moved around and expelled and the magnitude of the tragedies that the world has seen in 1939 to 1945, one can see why the expulsion of three quarters of a million people was not seen as something that extraordinary or something that demands a particular attention. It was a very bad year to be a victim of an ethnic cleansing. It's much better to be today. <laughs> but the fact that the world sent a very clear message to Israel, you are still a democracy, you are a dignified member of a community of civilized nations, despite the fact that you have ethnically cleansed the Palestinians, was a very important message. Because it the idea of ethnic purity and supremacy became the inf ideological infrastructure for the Jewish state. Uh, therefore, the Palestinians who remained in Israel were put under military, ruthless military regime between 48 to 1966, and the world didn't care <coughs> because Israel was still the only democracy in the East. It was America's main ally in the Cold War. Uh, and uh, it was regarded as a domestic uh, affair. Now here we come to 1967. The, the 1967 war has its own mythology. And it's time to write the new history of 1967 as well. I mean, <laughs> we have uh, uh, lived for too long with uh, the narrative of 67 as we still teach it and read about it uh, as uh, just an Arab attempt to wipe out Israel and a miraculous, a miraculous Israeli response that defeated the Arab armies in six days and so on. It's far more complex than that, but I won't go into the details of that. But, uh, of course, I would be very happy to answer questions or, or uh, respond to comments on that as well. What I'm interested in here is less why Israel went to war in 67. But as I tell you, I think that one has to revisit that period as well and not just take for granted what we are being told. But far more important, whatever the reasons are, it's very important to revisit what happened immediately after the war. Because after the war, the Israelis had control over 100% of Palestine. They controlled 80% of Palestine in 1948, but the remaining 20% became under Israeli control in 1967. 
With the 20%, which was a great geographical achievement, came, from an Israeli point of view, a new demographic headache. Because the territory came with one million and a half Palestinians. Half of them, refugees who were expelled by Israel in 1948, exactly as not to count them in the demographic balance of the new state. So when you are hungry for territory uh, in the 1960s, it's very different from when you are hungry for territory in the colonial, colonialist age. In the colonialist age, if you are hungry for territory and you don't like the people, you can either genocide them or expel them. It wasn't that easy in the 1960s, although some Israelis contemplated that as well. But the war, in many ways, was too short, six days war. And uh, the Israelis were left with the kind of territory they always wanted. They really felt like, geographically, this is the future Jewish state. But demographically, this was really a problem. A million and a half, an additional million and a half Palestinian to what was then already a, a sizable Palestinian minority inside Israel. Not only that, these were a million and a half Palestinians who did not live under 19 years, for 19 years under Israeli rule. There were more Palestinians, if you want, than Israeli Palestinians. Uh, they were far more connected to the Palestinian Liberation Organization, to Palestinian identity and nationalism. And therefore, they were not just numerically, from a numeric, sort of from a, a demographic point of view, a problem, but also from an ideological point of view. They constituted quite a threat uh, in the eyes of the Israelis. Now, the Israeli government has uh, set uh, day after day after the Six Days War, and uh, to the credit of the Israelis, and this is still a mystery, um, the Israelis are although they're getting worse in it, but they're basically not too bad in opening up documentation. And in 1997, in 1998, the Israeli uh, archives for these meetings of June and July 1967, all through to the summer of 1968, were made open to the public. And you learn a lot from these meetings. Uh, you learn that Basically, the Israeli cabinet and leadership saw the 67 war as a continuation of the ethnic cleansing of Palestine in 1948. Regardless of how they thought the war happened, whether they blamed themselves or Jamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt, or it didn't matter. Uh, some of them thought that uh, uh, you know the Egyptians are responsible for the war, but that landed Israel with a golden opportunity. Others were more aware of the Israeli action that led to the war, but in the end of the day, it's the same thing. There was an historical opportunity to take over the rest of Palestine. And then you can see throughout the daily meetings that they had that they take three major decisions, which are with us today. They haven't changed. It's quite amazing. It's the same reality. Oh, I would say all the successive governments of Israel, including this current government, are loyal to these three decisions. One decision was the territories will have to remain part of Israel. Whatever happens, whatever you promise, whatever peace process you will be engaged in, basically the, these territories, especially the West Bank, not so much the Gaza Strip, but especially the West Bank, is the ancient heart of the Israeli nation, and therefore they have to remain in Israeli hands. Secondly, Israel cannot expel the Palestinians from these territories. Uh, maybe it was possible in 48, the world will not tolerate it in 67. So whoever brought to the government, some ministers brought to the government ideas of getting rid of the Palestinians, the vast majority of the ministers rejected the idea. Thirdly, there is no way that the Palestinians would remain, therefore, because they will not be expelled in the territories that should remain under Israeli control. There's no way that these Palestinians would be granted equal citizenship. And there are interesting linguistic debates in the cabinet of what to call them. <laughs> and they come up with the 
Hebrew word Toshavim, inhabitants. They are the inhabitants of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, which means they are citizenless citizens. They are inhabitants, as if the Gaza Strip is Madison, a city, or the West Bank <laughs> is Chicago. It's in, the inhabitants of a city. There are also sort of uh, decisions that emanate from these three major decisions. For instance, uh, there's a wish to be involved in the peace process and to be guided by the Americans in the peace process. But it's very clear from the very beginning that the peace process cannot in any way uh, question the validity of the three decisions stated. Namely, the peace process has to, has to provide means by which Israel can continue to control the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, directly or indirectly, means by which Israel would be allowed to retain the Palestinians without full citizenship, and means by which uh, Israel would not be forced to expel the Palestinians because uh, it would be forced by the international community to grant them equal rights, such as the right to vote, for instance, about their own uh, future. And I would like to end so that, uh, uh, to give you enough time for a long uh, discussion, I hope, by saying that the Israelis detailed to death the reality, if I may use this sentence. And it's very important to understand it. One, and I would describe it best, uh, uh, because I want to claim that this is ethnic cleansing in different means. It's not dramatic as the 1948 ethnic cleansing, but it is ethnic cleansing in different means. And they take additional decisions, and through these additional decisions, I would hopefully conclude the picture and, and leave it there, and then uh, we can open up a discussion. One decision is whether to involve or not to involve the Israeli Supreme Court in the running of the occupation. <coughs> According to international law, those of you who know the international law, Israel was not obliged to involve the local Supreme Court in running the affairs of the occupation. That's what the international law says. And yet the Israelis said, no, 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 we want the, our Supreme Court, which is the most respected establishment in the state of Israel, the most respected establishment outside of Israel, to keep an eye on our forces and our troops, so that to show that they are exceptionally moral in their behavior. The result was, of course, the opposite. Since the result was the opposite, I had the nagging feeling that the motivation was exactly the opposite. It was not to keep an eye on the Israeli crimes, it was to legitimize them. Almost every decision that people were taking to the Supreme Court against confiscation of land, demolition of houses, expulsion of people, imprisonment of people without uh, a trial, all the inventory of Israeli criminal acts that we are familiar with after 40 years of occupation were legalized by the Supreme Court of Israel, which meant that when people like you would come out and say, wait a minute, we are part of, I don't know, Human Watch, United Nations, international agencies, churches in Seattle, I don't know, <laughs> come from all over the world, and we have a high standard, and we don't like what you do, the Israelis would say to you, sorry, we have the internet, we have the Supreme Court. We checked it with our Supreme Court, it's fine. <laughs> That's why international law in Israel is, in, in the eyes of Israelis, tantamount to, to anti-Semitism. You say international law, they think about anti-Semitism. Why, what do you need international law when you have the Supreme Court of Israel <laughs> making uh, decisions? So that's one part of the occupation that has to be understood. Now it doesn't matter anymore because the Israelis are going to change the whole composition of the Israeli Supreme Court and all the liberal Zionist judges are going to be replaced anyway by national religious and extreme nationalist uh, <laughs> judges. So uh, at least the world will not have to believe these things. The second issue, which is very interesting, is the issue of the land regime. This 
is a fascinating story if those of you who come from the West Bank, you know it. The Israelis, of course, could go around, confiscate land, give it to settlers, and go home, right? No, they wanted it to be legal. So they looked at the international law. The international law does not allow them either to allow any Jew to colonize. It's against the international law. You cannot bring your own citizens to an occupied land. Nor are you allowed to confiscate uh, private land. And the Israelis said, OK, we have to abide by these issues. But we can be clever. A, we will find a way of showing that the land is not private. And then we can give it to the settlers. So there's an interesting chapter in the legal history of the occupation where the Israelis are recruiting the academic institutes and experts, which is one of many good reasons to call for the Israeli academia later on. They recruit them and they say to them, can you come up with something that would allow us not just to use force, but to show that this is legal? So they come up with the idea that during the time of the Ottoman Empire, Private land, it's called Mawat, private land that was not cultivated for three years was returned to the empire, became a state land, right? Now, there was a problem. Most Palestinians never left a land uncultivated for three years, and the Ottoman Empire was long gone, <laughs> right? But count on the Israelis, they resuscitated the Ottoman Empire, and uh, they had a scale of time which fitted the Middle East better than the rest of the world. Namely, if you didn't cultivate the land for three months, it's nearly three years. It's, you know, here and there, three months, four months is nearly three years. <laughs> the, 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 the man who was the inventor of this was Ariel Sharon. And uh, there's a famous uh, trip he takes with a helicopter. And he says, this is my wife, this is my wife, this is my wife. And, and, and that's how they legalized settlements uh, on, on, uh, and, and declared it a state. Now, why do they need it? That's why dictators need uh, uh, elections. <laughs> they need uh, 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 to feel that this is legalized. But it all goes back to 14. You use force to dispossess the Palestinians, but you use legal distance in order to say that this is not uh, a, an ordinary case of ethnic cleansing. This is legal, it was uh, examined, uh, it can be uh, um, recognized. And I will uh, end with another Israeli decision that I'm not sure you know about, which also completes the picture. Mm -hmm. When Israel occupied the West Bank in 1967, 1968, the first Palestinian guerrilla operations against the occupation stuff. People would come from the West Bank, and from Jordan, and integrate into the group of court. That's a typical Palestinian story, but uh, we leave the Palestinians alone tonight. How they were caught was quite uh, pathetic, but never mind. They were caught. Uh, and they had the military fatigue, and their intention was to attack a military installation. According to the international law again, this is a military operation. This is not terrorist. The Israelis had a very serious discussion, which I just discovered the other day, whether to call these guys terrorists or not. In fact, uh, they consulted American experts, French experts, uh, all over the world who told them, yes, these, this is a liberation movement that sent a military unit. And therefore, the people you caught should be treated as prisoners of war. And you should ask the Red Cross to come and see them. And the Israelis decided, no, no, they, they are terrorists. And that terrorizing the Palestinian action against the occupation became a very important part, important part from legalizing anything the Israelis would do later on, whether it's a collective punishment of demolishing houses, expelling people, uh, putting uh, almost every third person in the West Bank in, in prison without trial through their lives, uh, uh, putting children in prison. Everything is legalized because whatever you do as a Palestinian in the West Bank is part of the terrorist action. And it's all grounded in legalism. So when you face the ethnic cleansing of Palestine between 48 and 67, 
you are facing a state that genuinely believes it found a legal way of justifying what it does. So it won't be enough to protest and say what you're doing is wrong. You need to study. You need to analyze. You have, need to deconstruct their actions because the shield that defends them is not just sheer power, military power, financial aid from the United States. It is also a complex structure, a narrative that they have built, uh, which a lot of good people around the world still believe. And making them disbelieve that this uh, is not an easy uh, project, believe me. I know it at first. <coughs> but I hope this lecture contributes something to this very sacred uh, mission. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. Um, Hi. I was just wondering if you believe that it's possible for a two-state solution, like presented in the partition plan before the British mandate in 19... Oops. <laughs> and um, if not, do you think that Israelis have any right to the land in the Middle East, seeing that they were exiled from their homeland years ago, just as you, as you say, Palestinians are exiled from their homeland? Yeah, well, I, I don't believe that a two-state solution is, is a good solution. I think, uh, I used to believe it was a good idea, uh, especially, you're right, especially the, the way that the partition plan suggested it, which was much better than the partition idea that emerged after 1967, namely that at least both sides would have half of the country, you know, as it is suggested now. Uh, so I, I think that the only future for both Jews and Palestinians in uh, the land is to share the land together, uh, which means that from a national perspective, both the Palestinians and the Israeli Jews will have to give up a dream of a nation state, if that's what makes them kick. Because uh, it's not going to work there, to my mind. So I think Israelis have a right to be in Israel and in Palestine, provided they would grant equal rights, the same rights, to the Palestinians. Um, you know, there's a very interesting correspondence between Martin Buber, the Jewish philosopher, and Mahatma Gandhi in the 1930s. Gandhi was very critical about Zionism. And Buber was a very liberal Zionist, as you probably know. He, was, he created Rich Alone, the idea that Arabs and Jews actually should live in one by a national state. And Gandhi wrote to him in a famous letter. He said to him, the question is not whether it would be a two-state or a bi national state. The question is not even, he said, are the Jews really coming back to their homeland or not? So they're not interested. In so the question is, would the Jews allow the Palestinians the same kind of life that they desire for themselves. And Buber concluded this letter, from what I hear, I fear that they would not. And I think his prediction was right. Yes, please, here. Here, you. Yeah. When was uh, Israel uh, accepted to the United Nations as a country? And at that time, what were the boundaries? And why wasn't uh, the rest of Palestine admitted to the United Nations as a country? And why are they having to try to establish their nation at this point? Yeah. Israel was admitted as a full member on the 13th of May, 1949, as a full member. Uh, the condition for its acceptance was actually an American initiative that it would uh, be willing, as a result of being admitted as a full member, be engaged in negotiations with the Palestinians over three issues. The return of the refugees of 1948, the redrawing of the borders, and accepting the international status of Jerusalem. And uh, the result was, that the Israelis signed the protocol that accepted this, became members, and then, of course, forgot about it. So if you want, the United Nations, first of all, was not interested in granting at the same time a similar status to the Palestinians, but at least it said the way the state looks is too tentative. It has to negotiate a comprehensive peace. For example, Israel took over a lot of land that, according to the United Nations Partition Resolution, belonged to the Palestinians. And the question was, 
does Israel have the right to declare these areas as part of Israel? Israel is not allowing the refugees to come back. Nobody in the United Nations thought it made any sense. By the way, nobody in the American administration, the Truman administration, thought it made any sense to prevent the refugees from coming home. Even those who were very strong supporters of the idea of a Jewish state do not understand why Israel is not allowing the refugees to return. And very few people in the world rejected the idea of Jerusalem as an international city uh, holy to all three religions. But the Israelis uh, uh, disregarded their promise, if you want, to the United Nations. So that's why that acceptance as membership was not accompanied by any other additional means that may have had a chance, maybe, to create a more peaceful reality in Israel. Yes, there, please. You, yeah. Is it true that Harry Truman was going to withdraw support for Israel because of their, uh, their treatment of the Palestinians? Yes, it is. Uh, in fact, uh, far more interesting is President Eisenhower on this. He was far more severe on Israel. Truman uh, was very annoyed with the refusal of Israel to allow the repatriation, the return of the Palestinians. So it was less the treatment of the Palestinians themselves, but the very idea that the Palestinians cannot come back to their homes. And he exerted a very strong pressure on Israel including withdrawing a promised loan to Israel for $100, $100 million, which is a lot of money there, even now for me. Um, and um, the Israelis said, OK, we'll, we'll get back 100000 as a gesture of goodwill. Then they, typical, and I, they detail you to death, as I said. Then they said, out of 100000 25000 actually already returned illegally. 25,000 would be reunited with the families in the future. The rest of the 50,000, if they will show loyalty to the state of Israel, maybe they can come back, maybe not. By that time, you know, the Truman administration was involved in the Cold War, Korea and so on, was not interested in this. Eisenhower was much more serious about it. He, was, he thought in 1953 that Israel should allow all the refugees to return which to my reading, in the book I wrote together with Noam Chomsky, and I tried to prove it, is why Israel created APAC. It's lovely lobby that you have here. <laughs> Thank God we don't have it in Israel. You have it here. <laughs> uh, so it's called good things, not only you. And uh, APAC uh, was created by Abba Ibn, who was the Israeli uh, representative uh, in the United Nations, together with Jewish labor unions, exactly because the feeling was that uh, God knows how far Eisenhower would go. He seemed much more serious than Truman. He was far more outraged than Truman was about the idea that refugees could not go back. The Israelis tried to explain, it's interesting, I think we should draw some pride as Americans out of it. They tried to explain both to Truman and Eisenhower that it makes sense not to allow Palestinian citizens who were born in Israel to come back because then the Jews will not be a majority. At least these two presidents, with all their deficiencies and faults, <laughs> could not understand why you do not allow people to return because they are of their own religion. They really didn't <laughs> understand it. They really didn't. Future presidents who would be elected in different ways, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, would understand it. Yes. Oh, I've got uh, two questions. They're both uh, somewhat related to 67. Uh, the first is, um, I think your account of uh, Israel becoming a friend of the U.S. because of the beginning of the Cold War around 1948 might be simplifying things a little bit. I mean, there was fear in the, in the U.S. for many years that Israel would actually become a socialist or even a communist country. And also the question about uh, accepting the existence of Germany. Uh, Israel didn't recognize at least West Germany until 1965, I think it was. And then my second question, which is a little bit off the subject, but um, you mentioned a lot of archives becoming available. Do you think those new archives will shed light or any further explanation on the bizarre liberty incident? Uh, the first question, yeah, I, I think it's true. I mean, if you're right. Uh, 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 in fact, like maybe Eisenhower himself was tamed by the fact that he didn't want to push Israel to the side of the uh, Soviet uh, bloc. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it may explain, yeah, it may explain some of the American sort of hesitations on this. 
Uh, although, when, again, I have to say, uh, the Soviet Union was not different. Uh, it showed no interest at that time mm -hmm. in the refugee question. It supported the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, once Israel sided openly with the West, then the Soviet Union be began to help the Palestinian organizations. But it was not the other way mm -hmm. around. As for uh, the liberty, uh, yes, my guess is that if someone is interested, I think there is new material. Uh, I, what I saw <coughs> summing up is that, um, to me, this is the most, but it has to be uh, uh, substantiated, what I'm saying now. Mm -hmm. what, what I've seen, and I haven't, I haven't dealt with it because I was, I was interested in the big crimes, not the, 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 the little ones. That the, you know, the liberty was, was a kind of a, 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 an intelligence right. vessel. Mm -hmm. And they were listening to all kinds of military communications that the Israelis had. And that included uh, some atrocities in Gaza and so on. And, and I think that there was an Israeli wish to, to uh, dysfunction the boat. But uh, God knows. I mean, it could have been a mistake. It could have been on purpose. As you say, it's bizarre. Mm -hmm. worth, worth looking at, and I think there is new material now. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, mean, I just wasn't interested myself in it. Mm -hmm. Ziad? Mm -hmm. I just had a quick announcement. Uh, my name is Ziad Imamani. I'm a student here, undergrad at the university. We actually just established uh, uh, a Students for Justice in Palestine organization here on campus. So, to, <laughs> to inform the student body about the plight of the Palestinian people uh, in Palestine and in the diaspora. So, please, we have a table at the back of the room. Please come, and there's an email list. You can put your name and email address on it if you want more information about us or if you want to get involved in uh, future events. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, please. In the middle. You were talking about uh, one country solution for two nations. At this, at this point in time, what do you think is more open? Can you speak that? louder, please? Uh, I can. Yeah. At this point in time, what do you think is more open for that solution? What do you think wants to talk about peace more? Israelis and Palestinians. Yeah. At, at, this, at this moment in time, I think, first of all, the two political leaderships are not interested in a one state solution. The two political leaderships still think about what is called the two state solution. Uh, among the societies themselves, I think there's, of course, more openness among the Palestinians because half of the Palestinians do not live there. And the Palestinians who are refugees certainly would see the chance of returning uh, as fulfilled much easier or have a, more, a better chance of fulfilling the right of return through a one-state solution than a two-state solution. You cannot return to Haifa if you have a two-state solution. You can return to Haifa if it's a one-state solution. Mm -hmm. uh, Palestinians who live inside Israel also tend to support more and more the one-state solution because they would like to see uh, a better improvement of their status. I think the people who have doubts in the Palestinian side about the one-state solution are those who live under occupation because they feel that a two-state solution is connected to the end of occupation and think that it may undermine it. So I think uh, it's not the Palestinian Israeli thing. First of all, it depends which, who, who among the Palestinians would support it. Among the Israeli Jews, I think uh, very few people support the one-state solution. Very few people. But uh, I think that this is part of the problem. The Israeli Jewish public has to be, uh, in many ways, coerced to change the regime, change the legal status, the civil status. Very much, to my mind, like the whites in South Africa. They opposed the end of apartheid, but that did not stop the world from telling them that apartheid should cease. Yes, please. I, I have two questions, one about transfer and the other about the military situation in 48. Right. In your book, um, you make a very good case that transfer was discussed as early as 1937 uh, during the Peel Commission, of course, and that uh, a plan, plans were drawn up, the village lists, all the military contingency plans were drawn up years in advance, and that the ethnic cleansing, you could say, actually began in December of 47, like in the Kanaman neighborhood in Jerusalem. So I was a little surprised to hear you say that they made the decision, you know, in the in the spring of 48, 
you know, to, to uh, carry out the ethnic yeah. cleansing. It seems to me that it was it was planned years in advance. My other question is, was there ever any time during the 48 war when the I, when the Haganah and, and later the in, Israeli Defense Forces did not have an absolute military superiority over both the, the Palestinian village militias and the various Arab armies that entered Palestine. And, um, and also, just throw in one last thing, and that is that I, I got from your book that the Arab states did not want to fight Israel, mm -hmm. and that they were forced by public opinion as a result of the ethnic cleansing done in the spring of 48 under plan to let, they were forced to intervene into the Arab state area of Palestine. Um, so... Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, maybe I, I, I mispresented my case. I, when I, what I said about spring 48 in the talk tonight was the final, I meant that the final touch to the plan was done there. Of course, uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, as I said, I think I also said that between the moment the British decided to leave, they began to seriously plan the ethnic cleansing. I just think that they really had a, a final idea of what they were doing in March 48. But uh, if you look at the, at the ethnic cleansing cases around the world, they develop usually on a similar trajectory. They begin with a diffused idea, there is a master plan eventually. Or sometimes they're done without the master plan. As for the military, I, I think the only uh, moment was uh, when the, the Jewish forces were inferior uh, are some fronts in the very early days of the Arab entrance into Palestine, maybe between the 15th of May 1948 until the first truce, which was in the very second week of June. Uh, and this had to do with strategic decisions by Ben Gurion who wanted to concentrate troops on some areas and uh, decrease the number of troops in another area. So there were local imbalances. But all in all, I think uh, uh, the superiority was quite clear uh, on the Jewish side in this respect. As for the Arab, yes, I think that's, that's, a, that's a fair description. I think Arab governments were very hesitant to be uh, in sending troops for various reasons. The Egyptians uh, were involved in their own, own war of liberation against the British. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want to to get rid uh, to to uh, dispatch a large army. And really, in the last moment, uh, King Farouk uh, succumbed to sort of public opinion in this. And he also very he thought of mainly sending the Muslim Brotherhood, who were imprisoned near Cairo, <laughs> with the hope that it would be a one-way ticket to, <laughs> to Palestine. Uh, the um, Jordanian army, which was the best equipped army, as as Avi Shleimai leaders shown in collusion across the Jordan had a prior agreement with the Jewish army, so uh, uh, it was also hesitant in that respect. I think the only army that really was sent full-heartedly uh, was the Syrian army, I mean, there was no hesitation, it was kind of a, a joint position, both of the government and the people, this is the right thing uh, to do. Yes. I just want to understand you. Actually, I... Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll I'll come back to you. But thank you. My question is, how do you do Israel through your story and glasses? Is Israel strong because as the technology and the weapon? Is it me because of its failure to you you politically fit? What's your comment on that? Well, I think you're right. There are two pillars that keep Israel strong. One is material, whether it's econo economy, technology, military. And one is moral, ethical. I think they're losing the moral, ethical pillar. It's being eroded to such an extent that I'm not sure uh, they can really rely on it anymore. The Israelis call it the delegitimization of Israel. Uh, I think that this is a challenge to the very idea of Israel. Um, so I think Israel is much weakened. But you know from the case of South Africa that a regime that loses its moral legitimacy and has the military capacity is very fierce in the last moments, very dangerous when it is in such a situation. So I wouldn't draw any <coughs> optimistic conclusions from that uh, analysis. Okay, please. Yeah, I, I want to understand your position uh, on the issue of a, uh, a Jewish ethnic 
nation state, <coughs> right. comparable to an Italian or a French ethnic yeah. nation state. Uh, I understand you to say that both Palestinians and Jews uh, have a right to be in mm -hmm. Palestine uh, and that they have to share it in some way. Uh, but that you see a single state as a legitimate way to do that sharing uh, and a two-state solution to uh, ethnic nation states is not appropriate. Uh, and it seems that some of that is that you feel that the Jewish claim to ethnicity uh, is not fully legitimate, that it was a religion which picked up ethnicity. But it seems to me that if, if you look at the dictionary definition of ethnicity, uh, it includes cultural and linguistic factors, it includes a, a gene pool factor, it includes uh, geopolitical factors, uh, and that Jewish ethnicity has had all of those characteristics uh, throughout history. So why, it seems to me you have a feeling still it's not appropriate for there to be a, a Jewish ethnic nation state as there is a French or Italian one. Why is that? Right. First of all, if, if you notice, I began my talk. I don't know if you were here from the very beginning. I but I began the talk by saying that Zionism was born out of two noble, I said, impulses. Right. And I said one noble impulse was to define Judaism as a national movement. So I definitely, uh, unlike many other critics of Israel, I have no problem with the idea of Jewish nationalism or Jewish ethnicity. I think it's very legitimate. Uh, I also do not judge the two states versus the one state on the basis of legitimacy. I, I judge it whether these are the right tools or the bad tools for changing an oppressive situation. So, so my, my issue is not with defining Judaism as ethnicity or as a national movement. My problem is with an ethnic state that deprives the other ethnic group, which is also the indigenous group, of having the same equal rights. In other words, if, if Jews and Palestinians would have two states, and the Palestinians in the Jewish state would have equal rights, I have no problem with that if that's what the two sides want. But the whole idea of partition is that the Jews are taking 80% of Palestine, having a Jewish state, namely that whoever is not a Jew doesn't have equal rights to those who are Jews, and they don't care what happens in the rest of the 20%. I find it morally repugnant and unacceptable. Do you find the nation state idea repugnant? Yeah, I mean, I'm not crazy. I mean, you know, in yeah. France, if you're not French, yeah, if you're an ethnic minority, you really don't have full rights. In Italy, if you're an ethnic minority, if you're a, a South Tyrolean in Italy, you, you don't have full rights uh, as an Italian. Uh, this is one of the downsides of the nation state system. But why do you want to select Israel as the particular nation state that you want to have lead it, all nation states in the right direction uh, when you're not calling on other nation states to do that? For two reasons. One, it's my nation state. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm puzzled by my own nation state. Maybe it's immoral, but I'm very worried of my own nation states more than other nation states, and I apologize for being egotistic of this. Secondly, there is a great difference between the Tyrol people in Italy and the Palestinians. <laughs> According to the nation state, the Jewish nation state, the Palestinians are under constant threat of survival because they're there. You cannot say the same about the people of Tyrol. It's the only nation state in the world that I know that is busy with demographic accountancy. <coughs> they count. They count all the time. I had a colleague in the University of Haifa, Anon Sofer. I don't know if you know, but in Hebrew, Sofer is counting. We used to call him Anon Sofer Arabi, Anon who counts Arabs. <laughs> he would sit like this as a teacher of geography in the University of Haifa. The class would be half Arabs and half Jews and would tell the Arabs that they are a demographic threat, that they are a demographic bomb. And he would advise the Israeli government, Israeli politicians from left to right accept it, that if the Arabs ever cross a threshold of 20%, they should be ethnically cleansed. You cannot say the same 
about any nation state in the world. So it's not the problem with a nation state. It's not a problem with an ethnic state as such. It's a problem with an ethnic state that has no chance in the world of remaining an ethnic state without either genociding the other ethnic group or expelling it or enclaving it in two ghettos in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. This is what I find morally unacceptable. I think this is the most uh, significant challenge to Israel, uh, compared to many others. Uh, the fact that the Arab countries have a chance, nobody knows exactly how the Arab Spring will develop, but it has a strong potential for democratizing the Arab world. And democracy would mean that the governments would be expected to reflect the wishes of the people of Palestine. We've already seen it in Egypt, the pressure of the Egyptians to change the uh, terms of the bilateral agreement with Israel. I think the result would be a very strong pressure upon the Arab world that would fuse together with the pressure of the civil society in the West on Israel to change its policies and its nature. The question is the balance of power, because Israel still has on its side the political elites of the West, the financial establishment, the military industrial elites. So the, this equation is not going to grow. Maybe on the Israeli side, Israelis are not going to win anyone more. They're only losing friends. They're not winning friends unless someone from the Galaxy would become a Christian Zionist or would join APAC. But basically, if we're taking the globe as it is, uh, the Israelis uh, on that side of the e e e equation the numbers are decreasing, diminishing. On the side of the critics of Israel, the numbers are growing. And if it would include even three, four Arab governments, who would be dem which would be democratically elected by the people, I'm not saying it happened yet, but if that would happen, I think that uh, A, many more Israelis would think like I do. I really do think so. So I'm waiting for this, because it's a way of changing an Israeli position without coercing, without a war. And secondly, I think some of the Western government would be less timid in their position to it. Yes. I, I was telling you earlier about the experience of a niece who lived right. for several months on the West Bank. And she brought back, I think, two concepts that she sees that Americans uh, misapply to this. One is sort of an even-handedness that, that ignores the disproportionality of the violence uh, of the power imbalance and some of those other things. The major uh, manifestation of that she sees is sometimes that we have a very westernized notion on applying uh, uh, concepts of nonviolent resistance. She talks about the youth that throw rocks at a tank. And uh, she had a, a, a colleague who was with an NGO who said, well, the solution for that is we should replace the rocks with violins. And for her, it's this is one of the few things that a young person can do, feeling disempowered, living under the shadow of the occupation. The tanks aren't going to be hurt by this, and yet we apply kind of our own standard that they should somehow not react or to keep it all inside. How, how, how do you apply these standards of nonviolence? What do you think is, is, this, is something that Palestinian children can do to feel that there's, there's something that, that they can do about this? You know, I'm, I'm a student of the liberation movement, just a Palestinian movement, and I realize that certain stages in the struggle of liberation movement is an armed struggle. And uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, I can only bring my individual perspective while understanding if the Palestinians would not want to share it. And the point, there are two points I would make. One is that the armed struggle so far was not very successful in the case of the Palestinians. It didn't liberate one square inch of Palestine, to be serious about it. I also think it had caused a lot of harm and damage to the Palestinian people themselves, especially the suicide bomb stage. I can understand where it came from, but I don't think it was effective or productive. Secondly, I think the whole world 
sees a transformation into popular civil resistance. Not only in the case of Palestine. There's, the Palestinians are in many ways uh, epitomized this new wave uh, with their own transformation uh, into, or the movement into popular uh, struggle, non-violent popular struggle. This is why I support the BDS. I think the BDS, the Boycott Divestment Sanction Campaign, is a non-violent means of forcing Israel to change its, its, its uh, uh, nature and its uh, policies uh, on the ground. Uh, so, so my guess is that it would be more attractive to young people under occupation to, uh, to move to violent against the occupation, understandably, it would be much more difficult to educate third generation under occupation to accept the uh, raison d'etre of the popular resistance. But uh, uh, I think that's the best way forward. Uh, and I think more and more people think that way. Uh, put it differently, I think when the gentleman asked about the moral pillar, I think a, a further erosion of the Israeli moral standing is far more effective than 1,000 Qassam missiles, to my mind. But I may be wrong. Thank you. Thank you. I encourage everyone actually to look at some videos today that came out of Palestine, where um, there were some Palestinian freedom riders, who Palestinians who rode buses today, Israeli buses, and they were forcibly evicted from the buses because they are not allowed in buses that are used by settlers. They are, um, which is a very civil kind of engagement. Um, but yes. I have a quick comment and a question. Uh, the comment has to do with the right of return of the, of the refugees around the 1949-1951. The return of the refugees always had to be in the context of peace negotiation and agreement between Israel and the Arab, which of course never happened. That is the comment. Uh, the question that I have about a month ago, and I cannot quote, quote it word by word, but I think uh, uh, Abu Mazen made a comment about that the greatest mistake that the Palestinians ever made was the rejection of the partition program in 1947. Uh, how would you, uh, can you comment on uh, his comment? Yeah. First of all, about uh, uh, your first comment, I, I don't think it's a, uh, it's a fair meaning of Resolution 194. In fact, you know, the Palestinians went to the International Court many years later the court said the individual right, the individual right of the Palestinians to return does not depend on peace. Every international tribunal that has checked it said that it, it makes sense also if you think about it. The individual right of a person to go back to his home does not depend on any uh, political solution. The uh, massive return, if you want, the concept of return does depend. So there, there's a difference. And that's why, for instance, Palestinian leaders cannot give up the right of return. It's not in their hands. It's an individual right. OK. Uh, Abu Mazen, yes, I, I think that there are two schools of thoughts. Uh, I would suggest you reading uh, Walid Khalidi's article in the Journal of Palestine Studies. I don't remember exactly from which year, which is called Revisiting the United Nations General Assembly Petition Resolution. There are two positions, and I side with Walid Khalidi. One position is. Uh, the one that Abu Mazen talks about, uh, a, a sense among the Palestinians that they had missed an opportunity because they could have uh, uh, had half of Palestine, at least, for themselves. I agree with Walid Khalidi uh, when he says that um, uh, the Zionist movement at that time of the Jewish community, of the young state of Israel, call it whatever you want, would have allowed the Palestinians to be in control over half of Palestine had the Palestinian um, uh, movement or leadership accepted the partition resolution. I also agree with Sim Haflapan, and you can read his book, The uh, Myth of Israel, uh, that, where he says that there's quite a lot of evidence that the Israelis uh, uh, dis decided on the idea of taking over 80% of Palestine. Ben Gurion actually writes it in his diary. He said, if we take the map of the partition, Israel is not a viable state. Uh, we need 80%. It makes sense. Uh, so I don't think it would have changed that much as well. 
I, but the most important thing is the argument made by Walid Khalidi, which I accept in retrospect, of course. Uh, this is something, what you ask yourself as a person is what would you have done, if one can ask that question, if you were a Palestinian in 1947? And if someone would have come to any other indigenous native population and said, are you willing to give half of your country to a colonialist movement? The answer would be no. If, if the Algerians would be offered to partition Algeria between the white settlers, and the French settlers, I'm sorry, who were one million, and were there longer than the Zionist settlers, as you know, I mean, the Algerians came in 1830. Not one Algerian in his right mind would have said, that's a great idea, let the French have half of Algeria, and we will have an independent state in the second half. So I think it was not a mistake. I think that history would vindicate that decision eventually. My great sorrow is that eventually, when we will have a joint state, and we will have, believe me, we will, it's, it's unavoidable, the price will be very heavy, very, very heavy. I think Israelis live in a bubble because they have no historical sense, interesting for people who are so loaded with history. They really think that 70 years is a long period. So if you succeed at something to do for 70 years, nothing can change. Look at the Crusaders. They were there for 120 years. And like the Israelis, they felt invincible. You cannot be an alien element and alienate the area and even be the sub of the neighborhood and expect that one day something will not happen to you. Luckily for the Israelis, they have the Palestinians as they Really, luckily. On both accounts. In, and imagine, in respect, imagine the becomes economies. like part of the area, right? Uh, sorry, I, just let me finish the sentence, and then I'll respond to what you say. Imagine that the Vietnamese were the neighbors of the Israelis as a liberation. And secondly, the Palestinians, whatever had been done to them, their basic impulse is normal life. So the Israelis have a chance. They just have to get over their racism. My neighbors in Vietnam, my neighbors in Vietnam, object to the idea that Palestinians would live next door to them. So I asked them why. Because I'm, I'm, in my time when I'm in Israel, I'm trying to convince my neighbors to, to at least make our street a bi-national street. I said, do you want Arabs to live next door to us? I said, yes. I said, you know what? I'll be only educated Arabs. I'll be, I'll be only handsome Arabs, okay? I'll bring white Arabs. They look a bit like Ashkenazi Jews. No way. I said, what? Arabs? Next door? <laughs> this is racism. The Israeli call it security. But this is racism. That's why I want the one state. Well, it's mutual. You know that it's mutual. I don't know it's mutual. It is mutual. Show me one. Yes, please. Let's, um, let's take another question, please. Here, please. Yeah, here. Um, when you're describing the uh, one state solution or binational, um, I'm confused. Well, I'd like, I guess, more information. Sure, you yeah. um, <laughs> as opposed, you, you describe it as like a solution alternative for Israel, and, and when you describe the 80 to 20 percent um, percentage ratio that you've been describing, it seems like if you were to create a one state binational, um, uh, Israel would be an alternative to Israel rather than for Israel. So in creating a one state binational Israel, um, or, or whatever, I, I'm wondering what type of regulations would be in place to make it, to, to enforce it to be binational rather than a Palestinian Muslim state. Yeah. I don't want either. I don't want a binational state. I don't want a Muslim state. I want the Israelis and the Palestinians to live in a state like the United States. I want a state for all its citizens which is a crime in Israel. You know, according to new Israeli law, I should be in jail for saying this. I remember sitting next to Alon Pinkas, the Israeli consul in New York, who said, this is a dangerous man who wants Israel to be a democracy. <laughs> I want Israel, whatever, you write, whatever we would call it, to be a democracy. I want equal citizens. I want Jews, Arab, Muslims, secular people, Russian Jews, who pray in the Orthodox Church next to my house every Sunday, 
a Russian Jews who pray in the synagogue next door to my house. I want everyone who just arrived there yesterday and those who were expelled in 1948 to live together as equal citizens. Now, I know it's utopia. I know that this is an ideal type solution, but I would like to educate people to believe that this is a very noble, very noble vision, much better than the idea of a Jewish state, much better than the idea of an Arab state, much better to my mind than the idea of a Muslim or Christian state. But uh, uh, this is my vision. So I, I don't have any contradictions. I have hopes. I, I, I understand completely, but when you do not. <laughs> yeah, I don't sound like it. No, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. I'm human. Yeah. <laughs> what I mean to say, is, I guess, was I, what I hear when you're saying you don't want a Muslim era state. I, right. Um, when I resort back to the 80 to 20 percent ratio, what's to say that regardless of what we call it, it won't become exactly what you just said? Ah, okay, it's a risk. Yeah, of course. When you when you bring back an occupied land to the occupied people, we we saw it also in Africa. Would you say? I'll give you another example. Let's say some, and we we will agree about this. Some of the African independent states. I'm not paragon of democracy, <laughs> right? <laughs> Would you say that because of that it was not right to end European colonialism? By the way, I think there's a much better chance, because I know intimately the Palestinians, and I know intimately the Israeli Jews, there's much better chance that these two people would create something much better than some of the independent states that were created after the end of colonialist rule in Asia, Africa, and elsewhere. I think we learn something from this. The human beings are not that stupid. And the moment you humanize the Palestinians, the moment which my Israeli friends can to, the moment you think that the Palestinian mother has the same impulse as a Jewish mother, you can see the future in a very different eyes. Let's have one, one last question. My, uh, the guy who follows me to Jerusalem and comes here. I am a professor in Great Britain, the very country that occupied Israel that did not let the Jews into the, move to Israel during the Holocaust. But most disturbing what you said about tonight is concerning what happened in 1948 in the Independence War. You talked about the 20s and the 30s pretending that the Arabs and the Jews got along. When in reality, the Arabs were killing the defenseless Jews throughout the 1920s and 1930s, sometimes massacring entire Jewish communities, like in Hebron in 1929, et cetera, et cetera. Has it occurred to you that perhaps the reason the Arabs left all those cities in Israel is because they had blood in their hands, and they were afraid once the Jews got in power, they came to defend, they would take revenge and kill them? OK, thank you. First of all, the University of Haifa never gave me a PhD. The University of Oxford gave me the PhD, and I'm very proud of it. So just get your record correct. It's the University of Oxford, and they have not uh, taken back so far the degree. OK, now, more seriously, uh, the, any coloni colonization project, any colonization of a country is resistant. Resistance is sometimes quite violent. Some form of resistance, in hindsight, as in the case of Algeria, and in the case of Vietnam, in the case of the Mao Mao in Kenya, and I can give you a long list, includes quite tough actions against not just the army of the settlers, but also the civilians of the settlers. So definitely there was also violence that was added to the Palestinian resistance for the idea that their homeland should become a Jewish compared to many other liberation movements, it's quite uh, insignificant. That's why the only massacre you can mention is Hebron. You can say etc., etc., but there's only Hebron. And, and uh, therefore, I don't think that the violence is justified on any side. The question, the big question, as the late Edward Said has told us, is the source of the violence. Not whether violence on one side is better than the violence of the other. No, it is. What is the source of violence? If I come to your house, I don't know where you live, and I knock on your door, and I say to you, Mr. So-and-so, I lived here 2,000 years ago. 
would you mind giving me half of your house? <laughs> Between calling the police, shooting me in the head, or giving me a punch in the face, <laughs> I don't know what else you can 